I'm going to talk about malware for Soho routers, which is a really, really kind of cool and at the same time scaring attack scenario. And I'm going to give you the best information I currently have on hand. You'll get some source code. You'll see how the bad guys are doing. You'll see why they are doing it and so on. So before I go into this ninjas, lasers, pirates, and all cool shit, I just have to ask you for one thing. Um, put down your pants because some of this material isn't easy. And I'd really love for you to try to understand it rather than just write it down and be going like, whoa, what was that about afterwards? So who am I? My name is Naxato. I'm an independent researcher. And I came up with this Soho router hacking idea when fumbling around with one of my routers and it accidentally broke down and sec faulted. So from there on, I saw it as a stepping stone into more advanced stuff and I tried various techniques and see what I can do on an embedded box and how far you can go in exploitation and in evil code writing. And after that, of course, I saw some public bots spreading online and did analyze them and wanted to really see if this is going to be sustainable, if there will be more persons doing it, or if people will be giving up on that approach. So that's what you're going to get now. So what is it about? Or why am I standing here? Now, when I first learned about Malware for Soho routers, it was a real kick to the balls, right? Because I, I wasn't expecting to have my router so vulnerable to certain bad strings you'd send it and it crashes or it gives you a remote shell. So that was kind of scary for me. And in order to see the big picture, I thought to myself, well, how big is the internet actually? What do I know of it? How does it look like on a landscape? And the only way you can map the internet, of course, is if you would be evil and scan the whole thing. Because that's the only way you're going to get a really, really reasonable result on how it looks. However, this is not legal, and I thought to myself, well, okay, there's this really cool Latin saying, inter arma in imsilent legis, um, which means in times of war, the law falls short. So that's like how the internet looks on a graph. The lower axis is the IP range, and the upper one is how many hosts are responding. So you see that in certain ranges, People are really grouped, and in other ranges, there's nothing. So bot, bot herders actually use that info to scan only the ranges they'll find results in, because it's a waste of time to scan like an empty network, where there's nothing on to find. So that is really, really important to know. Now, the standard botnet CNC, of course, looks somewhat like this. You have a common control server. You, it's either IC-based, HTTP-based. I heard it was Twitter-based last night. Um, you have a couple of bots that connect to that common control server and fetch comments from the bot herder. And he'll be like, okay, scan me this, or DDoS that, I want all the passwords stored in your machine, and whatnot. So that's how it goes. And the average lifespan of a botnet, of course, looks roughly like this. This is three networks that are laid out for benchmarking purposes, because I invaded their RCs, channels, did bot count and everything. So what happens is, at the beginning, it starts spreading really, really slow. And afterwards, it kind of speeds up, gets its first peaks. Antivirus detection goes in. People will have to rearrange the binary, meaning they are going to pack it. They're going to scramble it. They're going to do some small fixes to get out of AV detection. It goes way more up. And then it's how it falls down, and it's time to get a new bot, a new source, start all over again. So that is like a year in time for, for the, like four major botnets I've tracked. And this is really a vicious circle, because mostly, mostly, your bot, gets your bot goes up, you have the source, you compile it, you run it, it gets detected by EV, you have to pack it, it's undetectable, it, then it gets detected again because somebody found its signature. So you pack it again, you scramble it using another packer, and you play that again till you reach the beginning because at some point they'll just have really good signatures for you, so you actually need to take a look on new source rather than trying to patch your old botnet, and this spins around. Now, the, that is really great for desktop computers, however, the real danger is on routers, you don't have this circle because there's no AV software. There's nothing you can really do about it, so this vicious circle kind of falls short, which makes those botnets more attractive than regular ones because you don't have to worry about parking it every week, changing hosts, changing DNS servers, getting new domains, generating random domains to keep your, get your bots back in so people will not just register all domains or deregister all of them and you'll be, like, screwed. So that's how it goes. And on the router botnet, you don't have to do that because you have one stable common control, and you may update from time to time 
to new DNS, to new servers and everything, but that's totally fine. That's like lower end management because that isn't a pain to go through. However, getting a new packet that's undetectable, verifying it's undetectable means you need to have like 15 antivirus solutions just to scan it. And those people don't submit to like virus total or anything because they know that if they do that, their samples are going to end up in some sort of corporate that really goes and takes them apart and builds signatures for them. So they actually have to set up like 15 antiviruses on their home machine in order to just see if it works, in order to just see is it detected or is it undetectable. So that's what they do. And by undetectable, of course, I mean not detectable by AV, which is a term that is used wrong in the botnet scene. <laughs> because, because if it's undetectable by, undetectable by AV, it doesn't mean it's undetectable at all. So I'm kind of curious. Like, do you guys even have an imagination on how it will look on the landscape? Because that's, that's how a usual home network looks like. You have one to three clients. You have a router. You may, you may have a modem that includes a router. So you get twice the ownership if you get both boxes. And then you have some uplink to the ISP that will basically route you through the internet. Now the big problem with those devices is that they cost like 60 to 80 years, which is about 15 beers eventually. And on that budget, <laughs> and on that budget you need to build a device that actually routes your traffic, that doesn't crash too often. You need a web interface that should be somewhat usable. Most of them aren't, but they, they at least should be giving you that. And then you need to bring in security so it doesn't get hacked all over the place. And that is actually a really hard task if you are not really knowing what you're doing because most of those vendors are like, okay, we buy a hardware platform from there. Here's our software team, wrap up a nice little embedded Linux, put it on there, put some web interface on and be done with it. No security at all. So I know, of course, this is a really, really tough balance one has to take. Like, okay, we're going to spend that much on security and we're going to spend that much marketing and whatnot. But this doesn't really fall into the domain of hacking routers. It's just a little side note to know that that's the way it goes. And I'm going to promise you one thing. Later on, I'll show you how to fix all the home router security problems for 10 cents a piece. Um, you'll see. It's actually really amazing tech that only costs 10 cents. And that isn't any vendor specific, because anyone can do it. You can buy it off the shelf anywhere in any electronics department. So. When they started researching on, or when they started the research on who is our customer, they of course get all these results like, yeah, okay, so this is standard people using it, so it of course needs to be usable. And if it's not obvious how it functions, then it's not usable, of course. The sole pro or one of the major problems we have on routers is that they are all based around one thing, which is a password, of course. Some of them use really clever PKI, and you need to install public key cryptography software on your computer that may have already been infected by malware just to configure your router. But then again, once you know which computer in the network has it, it's really easy to get back onto the router, just using a simple browser exploit, for example. And there's, there's two kinds of techniques on how to get a router. The one, of course, is push technique and pull technique. What do I mean by that? Well, push technique is simple. You have like a web interface, a Telnet daemon, SSH, or whatever, running on a public port. And people will just go and scan over it. There has been a public bot. It's, what was it called? It has only been some sort of semi-automatic D-Link D -link router, auto router, which would basically scan a P ranges, send a funny HTTP request, parse some stuff, and then recover the password from it. And the same box had, had SSH running on it and Telnet. So you just do this web request. You parse it a little. You know the password. It's a Linux box, username's root because you don't have user separation on routers. And then you just log in using SSH Telnet and be done with it. You have a root shell. So that was for one of the models that were hacked all over the place last year. So that is push technique, where you just push against it from the outset, of course. Many vendors are really, really quick to tell that, OK, so it's not a problem that our web interfaces are all buggy, that they are all screwed up over the place, because you can't get to them. Because they are not accessible from outside of the network. Like, that was real. Because they argue that they use network address translation that translates your external IP address into an internal IP range. And they say, OK, you can't reach from the outside. You can reach it only from within the network. It's not a problem. Now, first off, argumenting network address translation as basic firewalling is wrong. That, that is not the way the game goes. Second one is, of course you can get onto it. Let me give you a quick example. So 
I'd be surfing the web, I see some banner, I click on it by accident, and my computer does a HTTP request to a website. Now, it doesn't matter which way it goes at this point, but there's, again, two techniques for doing that. And the next thing that happens is, of course, this website embeds some code, it being either a browser exploit or you do complicated stuff like DNS rebinding to get your browser the ability to script against the router, or in case you exploit the browser, you're already on the box, so you'll just need to do a simple connection and be done with it. So next step is computer, of course, connects to the router, and from there on, it's really, really easy to eventually control the box, take it over, and once it's refreshed, abuse it really, really hard. And this is some sort of recurring kind of problem that we have eventually, because most of the issues we have on routers are stuff we dealt in IT with 10 years ago. I'm not kidding you. Actually, it's all about input validation. It's all about design mistakes, of course. So that is kind of funny. And I mean, I don't know who came up with this, but using an embedded web server that runs shell scripting and HTML combined to build a web interface is not such a good idea at all. Even if, and twice as much if the web server, of course, runs as root because you don't have user separation. So you just need one tiny bug, one regular expression that is not totally straightforward in order to exploit and get root on a router, which is kind of amazing. And yes, of course, a person will stumble over a tiny stone if they don't see it. And that is the big problem. I'll just get, forget like a backslash on my regular expression and fail so hard because somebody will just put in a totally valid text, add a semicolon that it didn't separate, and then put their shell command and you have like a reverse connect shell on it. It goes that fast and it's that easy to get into. The problem is this is a really, really dark road because when router is hacking so easy, it actually becomes easier than taking on the regular clients because as I showed you before, on a regular botnet, you have to patch. On a router botnet, you just go, okay, I infect once, I switch, so it's like weekly, not on a daily basis. So it goes, it's more long term and it's more stable because computers will get shut off during the night, which means, okay, so botnet just sits in his channel and you can tell exactly when it's 8 p.m. in America because computers will go down. You lose like one third of your botnet at night and they come on during the day again. So. Routers are more stable. It's not like you shut it down every time you go to sleep. It's just sitting there eating at five to 10 watts right next to your internet uplink and, and all the time you aren't doing stuff. This, can, this thing can even send a really, really hard DDoS because, okay, here's the thing. Your router sits on your internet line before your computer. And therefore, if it feels like DDoSing something, if it feels like sending massive amounts of data, it doesn't have to share its bandwidth at all. It just goes like, okay, you're disconnected for now. I'll fire and forget for five minutes. Then I'll put it back on. And as soon as the customer calls the support hotline, hey, my internet's down, we can ping you, it's totally working. He tries again and it works again because even though you're only sending traffic for five minutes, you, you aren't shooting like at one megabit a second, maybe like on average clients, you can shoot like your six or 10 megabits that you have on your home line fully. You don't need to share that traffic. So DDoS gets kind of terrific if you really think about how it goes into the technique. And uh, from now on, I want to discuss a couple of routers to illustrate more router bugs, okay? Um, I've taken like four of them, which are different vendors. Eventually, there's like the speed port from a German company, which is screwed up all over the place on the web interface. And all it takes to exploit is basically JavaScript in the browser, doing DNS rebinding, and then hopping onto it and owning this stuff. Then, of course, we have OpenWRT, which is prone to several, or at least, I don't know about the newest build, but like the last one I checked out two weeks ago, still has a couple of bugs in the web interface, which is, okay, so you add this to the URL, you send a HTTP request that looks that way, and next thing you see is a common prompt, or your common gets executed and reverse shell goes directly to you. Because on some of those routers, they're even so friendly. The, in some cases, you even find netcat on there, which means you don't need to bring your own shell to connect back to you because the binary is already there. You just go netcat, port, blah, and you have a connection. Then, of course, we have this D-Link massacre I talked about earlier with the public, the public ports. So this is like roughly what the HTTP request looks like. This is from an evil script I found on a router. And all it will do is assemble a HTTP request that is totally valid, that requests one file, and write it to a text file because botnetters have humor. And the guy that fixed this actually 
did find this on a hack box, I guess, because he fixed the spreading method. And he even left in the comments in his little, sh in his little script. So you can see that, where is it? Somewhere should be a comment about it being ridiculously slow. <laughs> like this spreader takes like two seconds per host. <laughs> and this is much faster. So it's really, really funny to see that those guys have some sort of own humor for it. And after they fix that, it goes like maybe five to 10 IPs at a second. But if you have a botnet of like 50,000 hosts, that's fucking fast for scanning. And of course, we had one really, one really interesting issue that open source guys actually exploited to put firmware into a router, which is of course on the Funera. And I'm not going into detail on that one because it was just input vulnerability at all. So what could one theoretically do with a hacked router? Well, if you're hacking a router, you can do all sorts of things. The most fun part that strikes me immediately is most of them have United Plug and Play enabled, which means that when you have a nice application on your desktop like BitTorrent client, they can go and announce, announce like, hey, I need this port range because I want to pass through. So when you have UPnP enabled, you can actually do stuff like, okay, so this outside, this outside port links to this outside port, so it gets routed back, and you do this on two ports, and write a little Perl script, and once you're done, you even have a transparent proxy set up using UPnP from a browser without exploiting the host. Um, if you really exploit it, you can do all sorts of cool stuff, like you have this unlimited amount of bandwidth. You can just send all your scam email so fast, and nobody's going to catch you, really, because you have 50,000 hosts. And even more fun is, of course, the way usually when you have scam pages on the internet, the way they get taken down, somebody reports them, and this gets passed on and somebody will deregister the domain, somebody will take down the server, and they deal with it and they put it on blacklist. However, if I'm on a router, I don't even need to worry about that because my router already has a web interface that I can, and it has a web server that you can script on. So what you go ahead and do is you actually put the fucking scam page onto the router's web server which is, of course, crazy cheddar technique. But apparently, you can't blacklist, like, you can't visit your, you can't use your browser to visit any IP address in your local network. You can't do that, because it could be a scam page. That's not the way how it goes. You can't blacklist that. And even more fun, when you control the router, you can even just say, well, it should go to PayPal. I don't feel like it. I'm going to just to redirect it to myself. Good luck, because it is in the wire in front of you and it doesn't need to like, really validly pass on what it does. It could do that in case you want to run a sniffer, but, but for stuff like scam pages, you can run that locally in the router without anybody noticing. And that is a really, really cool attack scenario, of course. And whilst you are in the line in front of the user, you can, of course, do crazy-ass man-in-middle techniques because you're really in the middle. It's not like you are on the local wireless and you try to be faster than the other server so you can man in the middle stuff. No, you're actually in front of it, like on the hard wire. Everything gets routed through you. If you're on a router and you see like, okay, there's this SSL request coming, should I pass it on? No, I'm gonna just send you HTTP redirect code and deal away with it. Or you can do all sorts, on, all sorts of man in the middle stuff with that. And of course, I wanna give you a really funny story that makes that makes a really legit project so badass on routers. Because when I first started getting into Tor, I was really satisfied with the anonymity it gives. Of course, this has been disproven by now, but it was really convenient to use. And the problem with that is, you can go ahead and do onion routing on routers. And what happens is, okay, so I have this whole ISP owned, in theory. And I say, okay, so those 50,000 bots over there should just do onion routing so nobody knows where the traffic originally comes from. So I can abuse that network, and if they route internally, it gives them enough diversity to not, be no to not notice what I do on the network, which is kind of cool. Problem with that is most ISPs by now do overselling. They sell more resources because users and online 24-7 leeching like hardcore. Some of them are, but most of them will just have bursts, so it kind of so it kind of rotates and shifts, and it's not a problem. However, once you have an ISP that does overselling really hard and he has a router botnet, and you start doing this onion routing stuff, the overhead from that will actually kill the network. I'm not kidding you, just the overhead traffic. Because you have constant data flow then. Because you need to link the nodes, you need to know who's who in the network, how it works. And of course, 
if you have a router, you can do the same thing that you can do on a desktop, desktop which is pay-per-click fraud. And I have a really, really cool technique for that as well that I want to share with you. So pay-per-click and pay-per-view ads work this way. You sign up to a website, and they tell you, like, okay, if this banner gets seen 50,000 times on your homepage or whatever, we don't care. You just have to use the right encoding for it. You'll get this amount of money. And what botnetters do to finance their CNC, not all of them do it, but some of them like this, they sign up for it, and they have the botnet visit it periodically. The only major problem with that is they get blacklisted because it's not real user requests that are coming from a botnet, and you can tell by the clicking behavior and everything. How about this? When you're already on a router and you're sitting in the middle of it and you're seeing the traffic, you do something that's called <laughs> fisting. So what it does is, at the time the HTTP data flow passes through, um, at the time the HTTP data flow passes through, you'll go and actually inject JavaScript into one HTML tag every 45 minutes to show, to show an ad, and users will f totally fall for it as long as you don't do Google. Um, not for the reasons of a Google guy being here, but um, people know that there's no ads or banners on Google. I think they've wrapped their head around that by now. Um, the point is, the point is if, if you just go to any website that's non-major and embed an ad in it, people will see it and some of them will click on it, which get, generates revenue for you because that's how you finance like your CNC servers in that scene or partially. So what has been really live on the networks is the next big question, of course. And there's, <laughs> there's been a couple of bots around. Some were spreading harder, some were spreading less. And I want just to take, a, take one that I really like because the guy had some humor in his command and control channel where he put messages of the day that were funny. So I'm just going to highlight that. Um, so it has been in the media as a bot. And I think you should know Psybot by now because it has been hyped for like half a year. So, but most people don't know how it works internally. And what it does is, as its shell code, it will basically go there, delete something, which is, which is maybe a previous version of it, download it, make it executable, and run it. And in case, in order to lock the user out of the router, you go ahead and just drop everything that comes onto the router, which is not so good technique, because when you actually fix the bugs in a web interface, and remove certain options like, hey, reflash my firmware. You don't even need to care about users not being able to fumble around with the web interface because what you originally want when doing this is, OK, so he has a new ISP. He takes his router along. Come back to me because it will just come back online to you if he doesn't reflash it, which happens, of course, if you're locked out of the web interface and you can't change the login details. Um, this network has been about 80,000 bots at its peak which is one of the smaller ones. But then again, 80,000 times 6 megabits is a lot of traffic. You can DDoS pretty much everything off the net today with that amount of bandwidth. And common control server was, of course, some crappy dot toe thingy. Um, password and everything is on there. It has a certain nick pattern, so the botnet will know if it's a valid one. And the generation works like this. You have this prefix, you have a couple of fixed values, and then you have a random number, so there's not too many bots with the same name in the channel, because otherwise you'll have a conflict. And people just tend to use like all sorts of hardware ID thingies to like serial number of the motherboard is great for that. They'll just use a number like that, put it into the NIC pattern, so they, they don't have conflicts on the network. They don't need to build a, OK, my NIC's take. I need to reconnect thing, because this just gets avoided that way, because how big is the chance of having two motherboards that have the same serial number? Um, unless, unless you're really, really out of luck, that doesn't happen too often. But how do you detect it? How do you, get, how do you get a hand? How do you get hands on source? How, how do you actually cap, catch spreading bots? Well, that's a big issue, because let me refer to the onion routing thing I talked about earlier. This is really difficult. In case you have onion routing, story goes somewhat like this: the first time it gets noticed that is that there's a knock on some door. Doesn't matter which door. And preferably in the store, your old lady or whoever you imagine that has no clue about computers opens up and police is there with a search warrant. And the reason why I'm searching her home is for child porn. Because they know from her IP address child porn has been downloaded. 
as the most hardcore example I can find. Problem with that is, okay, so it was onion routed, which means she, she has nothing to do with it. She doesn't even have a computer. This is just from, from her younger daughter, and she has her laptop with, you, with her, so you only have the router. And police will be there like, okay, nothing's here. We search that, check that off. Maybe take a couple of other things, like videotapes, and watch them to see if there's really nothing on it. So this is really hard for law enforcement, of course, to keep track of. And the other problem is that the router, okay, so when you usually have a bot in one of your company's machines, you'll go there, and if you have good switches, you'll just duplicate all the traffic that passes to it, to a different port, and add a sniffer to it, and see what it does, what's the NIC pattern, how does it go to CNC, where does it get its updates from, what can we block, and then disinfect it. However, with the router, it sits on the edge of your network. It's not like you could plug a switch in front of it, unless you're a telco guy that has a couple of spare racks to actually simulate all the hardware you need in order to have your DSL router talking, talking and sniffing the traffic from that. So that is really a big problem. Of course, if I didn't care about privacy, I'd be going to my SP and say, hey, I'm a really, really nice guy. I have nothing to hide at all. Please, can you want monitor my traffic for suspicious activity? Of course, that is the horror scenario. And, <laughs> and eventually, the ISPs could sell that as a security package. But then again, it's totally invading privacy, which is bad all over the place. But just as an example. Um, so it's really, really hard to track that stuff unless you go constantly to various routers and check them to see if they're exploitable. If, if they're exploitable and you can, on the box, is there anything on there already? Or how do you secure it? And that really, of course, gives us a really, really bad future trend. Because when we continue working like this, and when routers don't get fixed soon, because AV protection goes up day from day. I mean, I don't believe in antivirus as a Unix guy, because I know that they're pattern-based, I know that they aren't good enough, and that they are always behind the game, but it's better than nothing. And once a binary falls behind the game, they'll be able to detect it to a certain extent, or you'll at least have a way to figure out there's something wrong with my system. However, unless we find a way to really, really lock down router security, we have this problem that there's nothing we can use to find suspicious stuff on your route, on a router, unless you flash it daily, or maybe you have like a serial connection, a JTAG connection set up, so you'll dump the memory and everything, and then reflash it and do a diff. Did anything change? But it's really, really hard for a normal guy to get into this. And of course, the honeypotting approach totally does not work, because except for a few small ones that will spread on public ports from public vulnerabilities, they'll usually use something like Something like uh, ad, you purchase ad space on Google, you purchase ads on what not Microsoft, or uh, do they sell that? Don't know, on any major search engine, you, you go to pay-per-click providers and tell them, hey, can you embed a banner in that country for that long, that many views from maybe that region if you can track it? So you get really, really targeted attacks, and what happens is, okay, so user sees a banner, you may click on it, or there's JavaScript embedded in a website somewhere, that get, that'll get loaded, exploits the browser, or it does DNS rebinding, and then pop onto the router and be done with it forever. Because a PC gets reset, it gets reinstalled and whatnot. Your Mac does get reinstalled from time to time. So it's not really the best target you can go for, because when you build a, when a botnet is built, you actually want sustainability, because the longer it's up, the more cash it can generate, if you feel like it, the more bad stuff you can do with it. Even if it's just a kitty and saying, hey, I want to DDoS that website off because evil hackers rule sucks, something like that. So you can basically, you basically want the sustainability of your attacks being there all the time. You want the sustainability of, okay, I now need a couple of bank accounts, dump me all your passwords, I need that now. And I don't want to build a new botnet to do that. So they really want this sort of sustainability. The longer the botnet's up, the better for them because they don't need to do much patching on it. And of course, I want to raise a really interesting question here. I don't know if there's any guys that are involved with router security in this audience, but thinking about this, I mean, I'm not an expert on embedded systems. I learned some stuff doing that, of course, but it's not like I'm the super guy that can write a sampler for three different types of CPUs on embedded platforms. That's not my case, not at all. However, riddle me this. Um, if you're just standing there thinking about how you can, 
how you can fix it. Is it not bad for you then standing there and saying, well, my router is secure. It's a small box over there. We dealt with that 10 years ago. So of course, what renders me or you from doing something cool that makes you, that makes you immortal? Because <laughs> the problem I'm tr currently trying to express now is, OK, so maybe you found a bug, your web interface bugs at some point, and you don't know about the security stuff. Of course, you can report it. And I tried to report a couple of bugs. I actually tried to report about 50 to 60 of them. The problem with that is it's not, I figured, OK, so I'm going to take off for two weeks. I'm going to report those 50 bugs. It should be done by then. Because I know that it's not that big of a deal to actually patch a vulnerability where you actually get the fix for it as a patch in your email. So I figured, well, those guys built a Unix system. They know, should know how to apply patches if you send them to that. And I had really nothing on my to-do list for two weeks. And everything that came back to me was from, like, stop hacking our routers, man, or we're going to sue you to, yeah, sorry. We, we are not going to fix this. This is on the internal network. They didn't understand that you can actually hop from the public internet to the intr intranet and then go to the router. I told them like five times, but they wouldn't listen, even though I sent them like demo code and everything. Various companies happened to me a couple of times. So the impression I really got from that is, OK, so those guys are basically too busy handing out business cards so that they don't notice the pick access. <laughs> and one guy told me, like, OK, so if we build the ultimate secure router, and we know we aren't doing it, but we could do it in theory, you have this big problem that security means, security means, of course, inconvenience. Because you need to have additional setup. You need PKI infrastructure. You need to roll out the updates somehow. But that isn't true. And I promised you guys before, I'm going to show you how to fix router security for 10 cents a piece. And the way you do this is basically you add one button that turns on all the management stuff you have on it, like web interfaces, like Telnet. Just turn the button off once you're done configuring initially and your router is secure, because you can't get onto the box unless you have like a buffer overflow in the Linux TCP IP stack, which would be some really nifty technique. But unless you get that, um, it's totally it's totally more than you actually want, need. And the reason why I think this, a solution like this would work so well is this is the marketing approach behind it. Because when, when I go and I'm in my criminal mindset, yeah, I could hack those routers. I mean, I have a wall on their web interface, and I could write a bot for it. But then again, 80% of all users have it turned off. <sighs> that doesn't pay off. There's not coming much back. Even though mo most users will leave it in insecure mode, people will get the impression that it doesn't, it's not what you want to do. You don't want like 20% of all routers. You want 9,200. So that is really, really a fun part. And as Sun Tzu already stated earlier, or earlier, long time ago, all warfare is based on deception. And I think a solution that's based on deception would in this case actually, to some extent, out be better than just going and improving security. However, um, after you have this initial threshold of time that, th that you have saved from getting all the bug reports, because it should, be, it should be in secure mode anyhow, you can then go ahead and start building web interfaces and everything for it. So the detection stuff with honeypots is really, really a big deal. Not only does it spread internally, but if you own like 50,000 routers, you can even set up a honeypot on that. You can set up web servers and everything. So they can even track other guys down and take over the botnets, which has been done like a couple of years ago massively when, other bot when botnet kids raided each other's botnet, DDoSing, using DDoS to knock the command and control server offline, being the first one to get in, get channel operator, do an update command, and then be gone with it, unless if you're fast enough. So let me real wrap up real quick. Um, the problem with home routers is that they are low-cost devices, which, of course, means not so good quality. And not so good quality, of course, means low dev times. From there on, you, of course, get bad code. And bad code means bad security. And bad security is the ultimate fail. Now, I may sound like I'm trying to blame someone here for this. But apparently, if people would just wrap their head around that only because, only because it's such a tiny device and nobody cares about it, it's not exploitable. Of course it is exploitable. And 
Now the problem is, it's so tiny and it sits in your corner and everybody has one, or at least most people have one, have a router. So the problem is like, yeah, my router's over there, but, but, but people don't think that this could be exploited, that this could be vulnerable, because yeah, we have firewalling on our computers, it's all great, we have AV on our computers. That, that is like the ultimate solution to a man in the middle? Really? No, you need to secure the way into the wide open network of the internet as well, because, because if you have a man in the middle right in front of you, you can only lose. You don't have many other options what you can do. And I figured that it is not me. It's usually, I mean, why does it happen to me? Why did I find a, find a bug in my web interface? Is that so common? I don't know, but I figured it should be them that find them and fix it, not me. Because then I could dedicate my time to some other hacking projects that I'm <laughs> so that is a big deal. Of course, of course, um, the, <laughs> of course, all the material, because I think some of you may want to take a look on what sources publicly available, what bots are currently spreading, is there automatic and semi-automatic malware already out there, like the D-Link stuff is, basic, is basically semi-automatic because it is a script that runs on either router or on a Linux server and it scans and it just put, gives you like a P address, username, password, a P address, username, password, and so on. And people will log in, hand root it manually and edit through the network. Then we have a couple of bots like the router bot Hydra and Psybot that spread automatically. And there's like two more, two more currently spreading that I haven't been able to get a sample of that actually used DNS rebinding technique to, to get onto the boxes. So, now that I've wrapped it up all real quick, um, you'll find, of course, the resources, the slides, and, and of course, sample code and the directories, and I think this will be up on the DeepSec website in case we can do that. Can we do that? Okay, good. So I'll put some sample code on the DeepSec website, of course, for you guys. And since I'm taking a look at my time, I think I have time for like th three to five questions. Anybody has got some? Um, yeah, hi. Uh, I just uh, had a couple of uh, comments. One of uh, well, the first of uh, first of it is um, it's great that we finally see more botnets on routers. It's about time. Um, these Linux-based devices are out there all the time, and many people like myself have have made a lot of uh, try to make people aware that there's a lot of possibility to exploit them. And um, I, I myself, I've been doing a lot of reverse engineering on those devices since I did a lot of GPL enforcement on the, on the lack of GPL compliance. And one thing, since you said the vendors, um, you know, you don't want to blame them or, you know, it, it's only because it's cheap and there is short development time, it's mostly a skill issue. If you look at the industry, if you look at how those devices are manufactured and who provides which particular part to which other part in the supply chain, um, you often have something like seven elements in the supply chain and none of the elements in those supply chain have any skilled engineers whatsoever. Nobody knows what they are selling. The companies, the brand names, even those which you recognize as traditional router manufacturers like Netgear or Belkin or Linksys or whatnot. You name them, it's yeah, totally They up. have no clue whatsoever what's in their device. They don't even know that there's Linux inside. Yeah, um, I can give you a really, really fun story to end with. Um, I had a really, really terrific bug in a router and I went to the company that I shouldn't blame here. Um, so I went to the company and phoned them up and sent them sort of hate mail like, why aren't you responding? Can you please patch this? Here's like patches and everything you need. There's the first bot spreading on your router. And they were like, yeah, thanks for sending that in, but our routers aren't manufactured by us. They are made in Taiwan. So I go there, I call Taiwan and they say, yeah, but everything we do gets distributed from Korea. So I call Korea, which is about 200 years in phone so far. And, and I call them and they, they tell me like, yeah, we do the hardware platform, but the software is built in Germany from the company that just sent us to us via two links. Thanks. So, <laughs> so it is really, a, it's not only a rat race, it's also hard to follow the paper trail on who does what. And I totally agree that some of those people don't have skill. But if you have people that don't have skill, you should at least get some security review for it externally or whatnot. 
I mean, it ain't that hard in our modern world. One more? Well, I, I agree with you actually that uh, router hacking is fun, and I, I mean most of the vulnerability are old school vulnerability, so it's pure fun. But then uh, you mentioned a few numbers, like you mentioned 80,000 80, uh, in terms of like uh, how, how huge are such botnets. Actually, I personally, I think it's easier nowadays to get a zero day Adobe reader uh, well, within a PDF format and then like spread such kind of documents instead of like spreading around uh, malware within uh, routers. And it's, well, that, that's only my, my personal opinion. Uh, this is just because it's quite ki kind of tricky to get, to, to be able to deploy such botnet within so many different devices and different configuration. Uh, if you have, well, I, I'm sure you are aware about the routers hacking uh, challenge hosted uh, within PDP page. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. Yeah. I had fun as well. But then, <laughs> if you look at the vulnerability reported, there were several vulnerabilities and so different, uh, even, if, uh, even within like same series of uh, routers, like same vendor, just different releases. Yeah, no. So it makes very hard, well, that's just my feeling, but it makes very hard to like build uh, your, mm, well, your t mm, software to deploy easily such kind of malicious. Uh. It's actually not that hard when you think about it. If I get like a zero day in, in like Internet Explorer 7 or whatnot, just as an example. I'd of course exploit that, put a bot on the router and put one on the PC and have the router one as a fallback. And after it goes down, you can still control everything. And also I find it more satisfying to do that because I don't have to compete against other botnetters on the machine. I wouldn't have to I wouldn't have to lose a lot of bots every day just from, yeah, sorry, AV detection went up. Nothing in that area. It's just more simple to, at the moment it's like equal, you have to put the same time and effort in, into owning the router as you put into the computer, but I see it like this, route, computer security rises, and if things get difficult, you'll just migrate to a new target. So that was, some of the approach I wanted to give you guys, really. And well, the second question is about, do you have any reference for these numbers? Because I, I know it's kind of tricky to, to actually get uh, like extension of nodes within a botnet, especially in case of such kind of devices. But you mentioned a few numbers, so I, I was wondering um, if... Yeah, I can show you some numbers later on if you want to. Yeah, sure. Like having okay, a beer okay, and... Okay, I got <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Because I'm more solid on numbers when I had a beer especially on the tricky ones. Okay, then that's it for me, thanks.